I can walk through a house once and know more about its occupants than a psychiatrist could after a year of sessions. I remember joking about this one evening with Peter Newbold, the shrink who rents the office upstairs for mine. Next time you get a new patient, I offered, I'll sneak to their house for a walkthrough. While you jot down notes about their history, dreams, whatever, I'll shine a flashlight into the attic, open a few cupboards, and have a peek at the bedrooms. Later, when we compare notes, I'll have the clearer picture of the person's mental health, guaranteed. I was teasing the doctor, of course, but I've been selling houses since he was in primary school, and I stand by my theory. I like a house that looks lived in. General wear and tear is a healthy sign. A house that's too antiseptic speaks as much to me of domestic discord as a house in complete disarray. Alcoholics, hoarders, binge eaters, addicts, sexual deviants, philanderers, depressives, you name it, I can see it all in the worn edges of their nests. You catch the smoky reek of stale scotch and cigarettes despite the desperate abundance of vanilla-scented candles. The animal stench oozes up between the floorboards, even though the cat lady and her minions were removed months before. The marital bedroom that's become his, the cluttered guest room that's now clearly hers. Well, you get the idea. I don't have to go inside the house to make a diagnosis. The curbside analysis is usually enough. The McAllister house is a perfect example. In fact, I'd love to compare my original observations regarding Rebecca McAllister with Peter. She was depressed, for one. I drove past the McAllisters one morning in late May, not long after they'd moved in, and there she was, out in the early morning haze, planting annuals all along the garden path. It wasn't even 7 a.m., but it was clear that she had been at it for hours. She was in a rather sheer white nightshirt, which was damp with sweat and covered with soil. People were starting to drive by, but Rebecca had become so absorbed in her gardening that it apparently hadn't occurred to her to put on some proper clothes. I stopped and said hello from my car window. We chatted for a few minutes about the weather, about how the kids were adjusting to their new school. But as we talked, I sensed a sadness in the way Rebecca planted a mournfulness, as if she were placing each seedling in a tiny plot, a tiny little grave. And they were bright red impatience that she was planting. There's always something frantic about that kind of bold color choice for the front of a house. I said goodbye, and when I glanced back at Rebecca through my rearview mirror, it looked from the distance like there was a thin trail of blood leading all the way from the house to the spot where she knelt. I told her I would do the planting, but she likes to do it herself, Linda Barlow, the McAllister's landscaper, told me later that day at the post office. I think she's lonely up there. I almost never see the husband. Linda knew I had sold them the house, and she seemed to imply that I had been derelict somehow in assuring the healthy acclamation of one of Wendover's newest treasures, the McAllister's. The wonderful McAllister's, as Wendy Heatherton liked to call them. Wendy Heatherton and I had actually co-brokered the sale. I had the listing. Wendy from Sotheby's had the wonderful McAllister's. It takes time, I said to Linda. I guess, she replied. Wendy Heatherton's having a party for them next weekend. They'll meet some nice people there. Oh, yeah, all the nice fancy people, Linda laughed. You going? I have to, I said. I was flipping through my mail. It was mostly bills, bills and junk. Is it hard going to parties for you? I mean, now? Linda touched my wrist gently and softened her voice when she said this. What do you mean now? I shot back. Oh, nothing, Hildy, she stammered. Well, good night, Linda, I said, and turned so that she wouldn't see how red my face had become. Imagine Linda Barlow worrying about whether it's hard for me to go to parties. I hadn't seen poor Linda at a party since we were in high school. And the way she pitied Rebecca McAllister. Rebecca was married to one of the wealthiest men in New England, had two lovely children, and lived on an estate that had once belonged to Judge Raymond Barlow, Linda's own grandfather. Linda had grown up playing at that big old house, with those gorgeous views of the harbor and the islands, but, you know, the family money had run out, the property had exchanged hands a few times, and now Linda lived in an apartment above the pharmacy in Wendover Crossing. Rebecca paid Linda to tend to some of her very same heirloom perennials, the luscious peonies, the fragrant tea rose, lilac, and honeysuckle bushes, 
and all the bright beds of lilies, daffodils, and irises that her own grandmother had planted there over half a century ago. So while it was laughable, really, that she might worry about me, it was positively absurd that she pitied Rebecca. I show homes to a lot of important people, politicians, doctors, lawyers, even the occasional celebrity. But the first time I saw Rebecca, the day I showed her the Barlow place, I have to admit, I was a little at a loss for words. A line from a poem that I had helped one of my daughters memorize for school many years before came to mind. I knew a woman, lovely in her bones.